Now, the Bible tells us about desire, about lust, about covetousness. But what exactly is it what we must not desire? And what can we do? What can we do to not become or remain victims of evil, deceitful, worldly, fleshly lusts which enslave us? Now the title of the sermon today is You Shall Not Desire, but I put the word not in parentheses because you can read it also, You Shall Desire. And so we'll have a two-part series of this one. Today I'll talk about you shall not desire. And next service we'll talk about you shall desire. Now I've given those two sermons in German, which come much closer to what I really want to address, because it's a play on words. In the English it's not all that clear, because many times the English translations, the authorized version, for example, doesn't really translate the Hebrew, but interprets it. And in interpreting it, it just doesn't show the emphasis of what is conveyed in the Hebrew and the Greek. And so we will go into this a little bit today. And of course, what comes to mind is the Tenth Commandment, right away, I would assume. And let's turn to this in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. And let's start reading at verse 21. Now I'm reading from the New King James Bible, but once in a while I will go back to the authorized version or some other translations. But in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 21, we read the following. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. It's interesting, in the authorized version, it's just the other way around. There it reads, you shall not desire your neighbor's wife, and you shall not covet your neighbor's house. The word for Covet, or desire, is a Hebrew word which can also be found in the parallel passage in Exodus. Let's turn to Exodus 20, but keep your finger here in Deuteronomy 5. Exodus 20, and in verse 17. Exodus 20 and verse 17. And notice carefully how that's being translated here in the New King James Bible. It says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Did you notice a distinction? I mean, sometimes we read over these things and you don't even see the distinction. There's a major distinction here. First of all, in both cases here it says covet in the Translation of Deuteronomy, in one case it says covet, in one case it says desire, but you can see already the same word is meant, the same meaning is given. But here's another important distinction. The Catholic Church tells us that if you go back to Deuteronomy 5, make it clearer, if you go to Deuteronomy 5, verses 6 to 10, it's all one commandment. See, verse 6 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall, not have, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself any carved image, and so on. They say all of this is one commandment. And in order then to make still ten out of it, they break the tenth commandment into two. Verse 21. They say the ninth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And the tenth commandment, you shall not desire or covet your neighbor's house, and so on. Now the reason that is wrong, clearly wrong, is if you go back to Exodus 20 and verse 17, because here you have a reversal. In Exodus 20 verse 17 it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, and you shall not cover, covet your neighbor's wife. See, house is first and wife is second. 
In Deuteronomy, it was the other way. So obviously, this is just one commandment, not two. And so what we have in Deuteronomy 5, you have the first commandment in verse 6 and 7, you shall have no other gods before me. And then beginning in verse 8, you have the second commandment. And the second commandment has to do with you don't make yourself any carved images, even of God, even of the true God. You shouldn't have that. You shouldn't have statues representing God and worshiping those. But the point I want to make, this was just something in passing, for people get all confused about this. The point is that in both cases here we're talking about desire. You shall not desire your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, and so on. Here the King James says covet. That's an interpretation. The Hebrew says desire. And so we'll talk about desire a little bit more, because the question I'd like to ask is, can you only desire something wrongfully which belongs to somebody else? Or is there more to it? And as we will see, there is more to it. Let's turn to the book of Micah. Micah chapter 2. Micah chapter 2, and let's read verses 1 and 2. And again, the words here for covet or desire, the word is chamad in the Hebrew, C-H-A-M-A-D. And that word is also used here in Micah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds, at morning light they practice it, because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and take them by violence, also houses, and seize them. So they oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Here we see a process. First, here are people who have power to do what they want to do. Then they covet or they desire the field of somebody else. And then they take them. They take them by violence. You see the development. First they desire something, and then because they have the opportunity, they carry out their desire, their evil desire. And far too many people today have the power to do that. And in the millennium, after Christ has returned, they will not have that power anymore to do that. But you see, to not desire evil things, wrong things, is a first step. Because once you have that desire, given the right opportunity, you will carry it out. You will carry it out. Let's turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. And verse 22, it says, how long, you simple ones, I like that one, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Scorners delight in their scorning. But the word is the same like we just read about in other places, they covet, if you please. They desire their own scorning. See, that's not something which belongs to somebody else. See, they have this own desire in their own heart. They delight, they, they desire to scorn, they desire to scoff, they desire to make fun of the truth. And how long, God is asking, do you want to be that simple, that naive, that ridiculous, if you please? In other words, or another sentence, let's say, where the word is kind of clouded because it's not really made clear that the word is actually covered or desire, is in Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, and I'd like to read beginning in verse 23. Proverbs 6 and verse 23. 
For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light. The proofs of instruction are the way of life, to keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress. Notice verse 25, do not lust after her beauty in your heart. Do not lust after your beauty, after her beauty in your heart. The word for lust is, again, the same word, chamat. Nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Adulteress. The margin says, the wife of another, or a man's wife, literally. So we're talking about adultery here. We're talking about the fact that here is somebody who has an evil desire for the beauty of a married woman. He has that evil desire in his heart, and then he carries it out. Later, we will read something Christ had to say about this in the New Testament. Is that so unusual today in this world? It's not. It's not. We had a former German president who was married, wasn't divorced, lived together with another woman, took her on his trips. I wonder, and he was a pastor on top of it. I wonder whether he ever read Proverbs chapter 6. Notice another interesting passage in Proverbs chapter 12 and in verse 12. Now here, this is oddly translated insofar as I'm concerned. I mean, I had to read this passage and I had to find some other translations to figure out what is actually being said here. But let us, let's read it first in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 12. The wicked covet the catch of evil men, but the root of the righteous yields fruit. Now, the word covet is exactly the same word again. In other words, you shall not desire. The wicked covet the catch of evil men. Now, the NIV says, the wicked desire the plunder of evil men. The new revised version, the wicked covet the proceeds of wickedness. And the Living Bible actually does it very nicely. Crooks are jealous of each other's loot. That's a very good rendering. See, in other words, here is a wicked person and he wants to participate in the loot, let's say, of others. And all of that is wrong. First of all, the wicked have some gain of robbery, let's say, and here's somebody who wants to have a part of that. All of that is, of course, prohibited in Scripture. Proverbs chapter 21. That is why the church is given a command. If we know that somebody is sending us his or her tithe, which is derived from prostitution, let's say, we're supposed to turn that back. We're supposed to not even accept it because we don't want to be part of that kind of evil prophet, if you please. Notice Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 25. Proverbs 21 and verse 25. It says the desire, here again this word, the desire of the slothful kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. He covets greedily all day long but the righteous gives and doesn't spare. Now again, the German Elberfelder or Schlachter Bible say, it's the desire of the lazy person which brings him death. The Living Bible has it this way. The lazy man longs for many things but his hands refuse to work. He is greedy to get. But you see, he doesn't want to work. 
And so his desire is an evil one because he wants to get something without doing his part or her part. And that is also prohibited. That is also included, let's say, in the Tenth Commandment, but in a wider sense. It's not just only desiring what somebody else has. Here, this person desires something, whether somebody else has it or not, but he himself doesn't want to do anything to bring it about. Let's turn to the book of Psalm 112. Psalm 112 and verse 10. Now here we're talking about first the righteous and his blessing from God. And then the person says in verse 10, but the wicked will see that and be grieved. In other words, he doesn't like that the righteous is being blessed. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. Very interesting, melt away. How do you melt away? Well, you are melting away, let's say, if you're being thrown into fire and extinguished. He goes on to say, the desire of the wicked shall perish. What we are seeing here is that the wicked, again, has wrong desires. And he doesn't want the righteous to be blessed because he lives righteously. He has his competition, if you please. And so he will gnash his teeth. You know, Christ has a lot to say about those who will gnashing their teeth before they're being thrown into the lake of fire. So here we have an indication in this particular passage that that is what's going to happen if those wicked people don't repent and if they don't understand that they have to give up their evil desires. An interesting passage can be found in the book of Job because the command not to covet desire your neighbor's wife will be enlarged here in a very important way. Job 31 and in verse 1. Job 31 and verse 1. Here Job is saying, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? Literally, why then should I look upon a virgin? Now look upon is a weak translation. The Hebrew word is bin, B-I-N, and it means look intently or gaze with wrong desire. So here Job, obviously a married man, but even if he wasn't a married man, doesn't matter, says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. I'm not going to look at a unmarried woman with lust in my heart. That's what he's actually saying. So the command not to covet your neighbor's wife it includes not to covet an unmarried wife, or a woman rather, with lust in your heart, as we will see in a moment. Well, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28. This command, which Christ is giving us here, enlarges the seventh and the tenth commandment. And he says this, first in verse 27, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Seventh commandment. But I say to you, verse 28, that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in her heart. And as we now know, woman can mean a married woman, it can mean an unmarried woman. The key is if you look at a woman with lust in your heart. Now, the Greek word here is epitumeo, epitumeo. What it actually means is to lust or covet with a high degree. Here's the point. If you do that, given the right opportunity, he will carry it out, committing fornication. See, it has become almost like common in certain parts in the world, especially in Germany, 
that people live together without being married. Every time I'm getting a request from somebody wanting to get in touch with us, wanting to attend services, wanting to be baptized, I have a long list of questions I'm sending back. One of which is, what is your marital status? Or what is your status? And of course, unfortunately, I get answers like, oh, I'm living together with my partner. I still got to carefully ask the question, what's partner? What does that mean? Female partner, male partner, what, you see? And so we go from there. But many times people are living together like the, it looks like the new German, uh, rather Austrian chancellor, Mr. Sebastian Kurz, who's you know, likely going to be the next Austrian chancellor. He's 31 years old, has been living together with his girlfriend for 13 years. Nobody thinks that that's a big deal. A mass tabloid in Germany said, oh, well, you know, this man is too young to have committed any sin while he is living in sin for 13 years. The point is, Christ is saying, don't look at a woman, married woman, virgin, with lust in your heart. Because if you do, chances are you will carry out what you desire. It's the wrong kind of a desire. Romans 13, verses 9 and 10. Romans 13, verses 9 and 10. Now you've got to ask yourself the question, you know, some go overboard on the left and on the right, okay? Some, if you even look at a woman, oh, well, that's already wrong, can't look at a woman. That's not what it's talking about, obviously. It's talking about the evil desire, which Christ is addressing here. Romans 13 and verse 9. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal. Well, let me just say something in passing regarding the word murder. Because some people have come up with the interesting concept that killing in war isn't murder. That's just killing. You see, if you do a search, a study of those words, see the word murder in the Greek is used, obviously, from the Ten Commandments. And if you put them all together, it clearly includes killing in war. The Bible defines murder as including killing in war. So the whole argument like, oh, you can kill in war, that's not murder, it is just nonsense. It is just invented by people who want to follow the desire of killing in war. That's what it all is about. But let's continue here. All these commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, here's a you know, quote of the Ten Commandments. And if there is any other commandment, it's all summed up in the saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law, the continued fulfilling of it. Not that it's done away with. You continually fulfill the law by keeping those commandments. The point is here, the word for you shall not covet is exactly the same word in the Greek which Christ used in Matthew 5, 28. It's the word epitomeo, looking with lust at, in this case, another woman. That's what we are talking about. And so let's go to Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. Romans 7 and verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Again, the word for covet, epitomeo. Covetousness, epitomia. It's, of course, the noun, same thing. It's talking about desire. But it's talking about the wrong kind of desire. Now the NIV makes the following interesting interpretation, I might just say. 
They say, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. Paul is saying, you know, unless the law would have told me that coveting is wrong, I would have never even thought about the fact that coveting might be wrong because, you know, I'm not doing anything. I'm just thinking, what's wrong with that? My thoughts are free, right? No, the law tells you, no, that's already wrong. It's already a sin because, you know, it will lead to action if you're not careful. The German commentary, Reniker, has this to say about this passage. The law prohibits not only the sinful deed, but also lust which leads to sin. The commandment almost encourages sin to bring about the lust within us. And once the lust is there, then only the opportunity needs to be there in order to carry out the sinful deed. And of course that is clearly talked about in the book of James. But before I go to the book of James, let's point out this. If you are being told that something is prohibited, and you see that with kids all the time, small children, that is almost like an inducement for the kids to do it regardless. Oh, well, I shouldn't do it. Let's see what I can do. How, how can I bring it about? Same here. Paul is saying, well, you know, now I find out from the law that I shouldn't covet. Okay, let's, let's try to figure it out. You know, my carnal mind in me tells me, so let's try to figure out what does it mean. Let's cover it a little bit. That's what he's saying. And of course, you know, when we had the prohibition during the days in the United States where alcohol was prohibited, right? I mean, you had more alcohol abuse, a lot more, than you had in half before and after alcohol was allowed. Okay, same kind of a thing, same kind of a principle. Let's turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Again, desire, the word epitomia, the same word which we had just encountered in Romans 7, 7. Now, it's another difficult passage, actually, if you think about it. What, what exactly is James talking about here? And it's worthwhile meditating about it, but he's talking about a process. And I felt the Living Bible brings it quite nicely. They say, temptation is the pull of man's own evil thoughts and wishes. These evil thoughts lead to evil actions and afterwards to the death penalty from God. You know, it first starts with evil thoughts, lusting with evil thoughts for another woman, for, you know, another person's house or car or animal or children or family or whatever it may be. That's how it starts. You can describe it with envy as well. And then, of course, you dwell on that more and more, and then you're looking for the opportunity to get what the other person has. And as we just read in the book of Micah, once you have the power, you will carry it out. You will carry it out. And that's the warning. And once you do that, and you don't repent of it, you end up in the lake of fire the death penalty. And that's what James is talking about. So he says, don't even go this route. Don't even give heed to your thoughts and dwell on those. That's why Paul is saying, you know, put all the thoughts under the obedience of Jesus Christ. Generally speaking, we're being told in God's word that we should get rid of evil desires or that we shouldn't have desire in and for evil things. Romans chapter 13 and verse 14 gives us this admonition. 
Romans 13 and verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We just read, you know, to have all, or we just mentioned, that all the thoughts should be under the obedience of Christ. So put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Again, lusts, epitomia, those desires. The Schlachter, the German Schlachter Bible, says that most sins come into existence because we first have evil desires, evil thoughts, and then we dwell on those. And rather than getting rid of those, we are contemplating what would be if. And so here's again the admonition to be very careful with that. Let's go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 18. Here are people who fall away from the truth. And so this is one category of those. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, verse 19, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things. Entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Desire for other things. In other words, desire for material things which becomes more important than God's word, what God has to say. It's not even talking about necessarily evil things. Here it's talking about the wrong kind of priority. And so we got to be even careful there. First Timothy chapter six. First Timothy chapter six, and beginning in verse nine. We just heard about the deceitfulness of riches. Here's one. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So here we have the wrong kind of desire. We have foolish, harmful lusts. Here the example is given regarding the desire for riches, but you can't put anything in here. And if that is dominating our lives, then we are in danger of falling away, whatever it may be. Notice 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4. Here's a description of the people of the end time. And we are living in the end time. And if you don't believe that, I don't know in what world you're living in. It talks about in verse 1 that perilous times will come, or times of stress will come, as it is actually also rendered, in, in dealing here with the last days. And then it says in verse 4, people will be traitors. They will be headstrong. Oh, yes, they are very opinionated. They know everything. They know everything. I mean, I don't want to go too strongly into the wrong direction, but I just listened to an interview somebody gave, a very prominent person, happens to be the President of the United States. I mean, I didn't see a lot of humility in this interview, I can tell you that. Headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Notice the distinction here. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure, that's again not necessarily the wrong kind of pleasure. It could be, it doesn't have to be. A distinction is being made. Rather than loving God, they are loving living in pleasure. Now, of course, it could mean the wrong kind of pleasure, of course. 
but from the Greek, it's not necessarily compelling. I want to show you something in the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, which might give you a different perspective insofar as how to keep the Sabbath. Remember, loving of pleasure, we just read. Remember, people are desiring other things, and because of that, they're leaving the church. Isaiah 58, verse 13, it says, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. Here the word pleasure is a neutral word. The Hebrew word is actually chepetz, but you see, it becomes the wrong kind of pleasure in conjunction with how to keep the Sabbath. So you desire something you want to do on the Sabbath, which God says, no, don't do it. That's not what the Sabbath is for. And sure enough, in doing this now, you not only transgress the fourth commandment, you also transgress the tenth in its broader application. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I mean the Sabbath, we've always said, and Mr. Armstrong has always said it, very rightly and correctly so, the Sabbath is a test commandment for most people. Why should I keep the Sabbath? I mean, it makes no sense, right? Why should I refrain from working from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset? No, I have to work. I have to you know, earn money for my family. I have to keep the job because after all I'm responsible for my wife and for my children. You, you wouldn't even believe how many times I've heard that argument, even during the last feast when people came to us, new people. Yeah, but I have to work on the Sabbath because after all I have a wife and children and if I stop working I might lose my job. And the question is again, do we want to believe God and do we love God first and foremost? Or do we look for other things, desire for other things which are in contradiction? But God clearly tells us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 6. It's talking about what is happening, what did happen in Old Testament times. God had got them out of, e of Egypt. It was Christ who led them out of Egypt, out of Egyptian slavery. Verse 5 says, but with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things, verse 6, have become our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. But again, the word here, same word, epitomeo, looking at a woman with lust in your heart, as we have just heard and read. Here they were lusting after evil things. What were the evil things? Well, the meat they left behind in Egypt, let's say. They wanted to go back to have the, the nice food, which they never had, but they thought they did. James chapter 4. James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now here's one people who are right now leading the nations, any nation, should read, and should follow, and should comprehend. It's amazing how many leaders in this world claim to be Christian and violate this passage day in and day out on a continued basis. Let's read it, James 4, verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? So do you want to know what the origin of war is? Here we go. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure? That war in your member. You lust and you do not have. You lust. Here, this is the word again. Having evil thoughts with lust in your heart. You lust and do not have. You murder. Clear connection here between killing and war and murder. 
you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war. Many wars, most wars, in effect all wars, are fought because one nation wants to have what another nation has. If you really boil it down to that, whether it's oil, whether it's other resources, whether it's the privilege of being now ruling this particular part of the country, of the nation, whatever it may be, it all boils down to a selfish, evil desire to get what somebody else has. You fight and you war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. That you may spend it on your pleasures. What victorious nation has really lived and acted in accordance with God's way of life? Not one. Whatever they got, they used it for their own pleasures, their own evil desires. And why is that? It is because this world is ruled by none other than Satan the devil. And every nation, every country, every leader is ruled by Satan the devil, whether they know it or not. And look what they are going to do, because this is what the Bible tells us in John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And that is why true Christians must not have anything to do with the politics in this world. That's why they shouldn't vote in governmental parliamentary elections. And those who do are either following the Laodicean spirit or have already entered the synagogue of Satan. That's how simple it is. John chapter 8 and verse 44. You are, Christ is telling the Jews at his time, he is telling all of us today, you are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. Desires, the authorized version says, lusts. We have just read it. They want to fight in war. That's what they want to do. Because Satan, believe it or not, Satan is the one who started war. He is the originator of war. There was no war. War didn't even exist before Lucifer became Satan. The first war which was fought was his, for, was his war against God, trying to knock him off his throne. And so here we have the desire of Satan the devil. And we in the world, if we don't come out of it, want to do the desires of our father. He was a murderer from the beginning. A murderer from the beginning. He doesn't stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Do we want to do the desires of our father, the devil? I mean, when I say our, hopefully it's no longer our father. But every time we give in to his evil devices, we come back under his authority, and we have to understand that. Second Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. We heard about scoffers before. Here we hear about them again. Know this first, Peter is saying, that scoffers will come in the last days, and we are living in the last days. Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, well, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Why would they say that? Why would they say, oh, Christ is not going to come back anytime soon or not at all? Because they want to walk in their own lusts. That's their justification. Oh, there's not going to be any reckoning. We don't have to give account for anything. We can just do what we want to do. They want to follow the desires of their father, the devil. But notice something about what God says about this world and the desires of this world. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. And if anyone loves the world, 
The love of the Father is not in him. Notice, it says the love of the Father. It doesn't even say the love towards the Father. We're talking about the fact that Jesus Christ's and the Father's spirit must live in us. And when this happens, then we have the love of the Father in us and the love of Christ in us. But if we love the world, if we really love the world, if we really want to do the pleasures of this world, John is saying then the Holy Spirit isn't in you because the love of the Father isn't in you. He goes on to say, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, it's of the world. And Satan is the king, the ruler, the prince of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. See, so it's only very temporary. But he who does the will of God abides forever. It's not only believing in Christ, believing in the Father, but doing what they tell us to do. It's not only a hypothetical faith, it's a faith of obedience. And then we will abide forever. And otherwise we won't. And so the point is that we have to get rid of evil desires, of deceitful desires, of desires which are worldly, which are fleshly, and quite frankly, which enslave us. Many people are addicted to something. Some are addicted to smoking. They can't get rid of smoking. Some are addicted to illegal drugs, mind-altering drugs. Some are addicted to alcohol. Some are addicted to sex. Some are addicted to all kinds of things. And the funny thing is, and it's not funny, and I hear this all the time, oh, this is a sickness. Addiction is a sickness. In saying this wrong idea, you're doing away with individual responsibility. No, it's not a sickness. You have a responsibility to get rid of it. You know, you cannot just blame it on a sickness, and oh, I can't do anything about it because I'm just sick of it. Well, I, you should be sick of it, frankly, but you should be sick of it in the sense of getting rid of it. And the Bible tells you we have to get rid of it. And the Bible also tells you that you can get rid of it. You don't have to be a continuous smoker all your life, a continuous drug addict, a continuous alcoholic, a continuous adulterer or fornicator. Notice Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and let's start reading in verse 5. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Idolatry. That's also adultery, but it's idolatry here. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Now, wait a minute. It's a sickness. I can't do anything about it. No, God says because of those things, God is coming and his wrath is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Verse 7, in which you also once walked when you lived in them. But something happened that they were no longer walking in evil desires, in passions, in covetousness. Something happened. I don't read here that they had to go to a doctor, they had to go to these lengthy hospital treatments. I doubt that they even had those lengthy hospital treatments at the time. No, something else happened. Notice Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Did you notice this? 
Jesus Christ is defined here as our great God and Savior. There are many people who claim that Christ is not God. <laughs> Some say Christ is an angel or was an angel. It's talking about our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, that is for good works. We already get a hint here as to how it's possible to get rid of those evil desires. Because what does it say here? Christ is there to purify for himself his own people. Purify, making them pure. We'll see this in a moment. But see, we all at one time worked and, wa and walked in worldly lusts. But no notice now 1 Peter chapter 2, but no longer. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So the admonition, because we are sojourners and pilgrims, we are kind of strangers, we are living here only for a while in this world, passing through the world, if you please, to become God beings, abstain from fleshly lusts. How? Well, first let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we're having escaped those evil desires which are in the world through his divine power, we read. How exactly is it going to happen? Is it because we are now going to doctors to get all kinds of medication to help us believing the lie that it's just a sickness and we have to treat it as such, or maybe there's nothing we can do about it. In our update, we had an article about young children who are confused about what gender they belong to, and now they are getting medications so that they can wait a little bit longer before they make a decision whether they are male or female. What absolute ridiculous nonsense. But this is the world we're living in, a world completely separated from God. And this happens, by the way, in godly, God-believing Great Britain. But, you know, the same kind of nonsense happens here in the United States as well, and all over the world. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit, and you will stop smoking. Walk in the spirit, you will stop taking illegal drugs. Walk in the spirit, and you will not do any of the things we talked about today, and a lot more. You shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, Paul is saying very unambiguously. He goes on to say in verse 24, And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if you live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Because envy leads to covetousness, and covetousness leads to action. If we walk in the Spirit, we wouldn't do these kind of things. We wouldn't even think of doing these kind of things. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. People have left us because of envy, jealousy, covetousness. 
somebody was ordained, they became envious because they wanted to perhaps be ordained or get a higher position. And now looking at somebody who was ordained as a challenge, as a threat, leaving the church over it. Titus chapter 3 and verse 3. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, or because we lived in malice and, you know, these evil desires, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can fulfill God's demands, that we can get rid of those evil passions and desires. If you go back to verse 3, where we read, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, and serving various lusts. It's actually talking about being slaves to those various lusts, or being enslaved to those lusts, as most translations have it. It's not just serving them. See, we have actually become slaves to our own lusts. And it's another way of saying we have become addicted to them. That's where we're living in those kind of lusts. And that's why people who are, quote unquote, addicted to something today haven't gotten to the point yet where they understand that with God's power, they can and must get rid of it. And as Michael Ling pointed out earlier today, there comes a point where we in the church have to act. And we never like to do that. But God has limited patience when it comes to the point that there's a time when even his patience runs out. And so we have to do the same. And certain warnings have been given. And we have to carry through with what we have said. So we can't continue serving our own lusts, whatever they may be, we can't continue being enslaved. It is Satan who enslaves the entire world, holding the world captive. But we have been freed from that captivity, from that slavery, and we cannot and must not go back. Some, be, some people have stopped smoking and now have gone back to smoking, have gone back into the slavery they have come out of. That must not happen. And we in God's church can't allow it to happen. Next time, I'm going to talk about the second aspect of this sermon series, because today we talked about the fact that we shall not desire. Next time, we'll talk about the fact that we shall and must desire. Now, you might be surprised to find out that Many times the same words in the Hebrew and the Greek are used. And that tells us something about desire. Because desire, quite frankly, all by itself, is neither good or bad. It depends on how it's being used. If it's used for the wrong purposes, it's very bad. If it's used to accomplish something which is prohibited, it's very bad. If it's something to bring about penalties or disadvantages on others, it's very bad. Because you see, the false kind of desire is always looking at ourselves, never looking at others. It harms others. It harms ourselves. When we think in terms of the example 
in conclusion, where we are being told not to look at another woman and this lasts in our heart, think in terms of the harm you create when you engage in adultery or in fornication. You are hurting yourself and you are hurting, in this case, the woman. There are always people who are going to be hurt by our evil desires which we might be carrying out. That's what God prohibits. That's what God detests. But there are desires which God wants us to have, and that is something we'll talk about next time.